Povich found a genuine 21st century legal pad. Denobulan weather towers seed cloud with silver iodine. And Dr. Culber interrupts books video game playing. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Ciroc Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we're doing a review of Star Trek Discovery Season 5, Episode 6, Whistle Speak, written by Kenneth Lynn and Brandon Schultz, directed by Chris Byrne. What a surprise. Very special guest writer, Brandon Schultz, is here. How are you today, Brandon? Hello, everybody. I'm 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 great. I'm I'm thrilled to be here sitting alongside you, Ryan, and Ciroc. Uh, and especially one of, Ciroc. One of the all-time greats <laughs> of the franchise. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Thank you, Brandon. Real quick, Appreciate a little bit love. of backstory on you, Brandon. You've uh, written a ton of episodes on Star Trek Discovery. Of course, you've been with the team since season one. You start off as a writer's assistant, moved up to a writer, wrote a bunch of episodes, and you wrote the Short Treks episode, uh, The Girl Who Made the Stars. That's pretty cool. Can you start us off just with that? Tell us about writing that Short Trek and how did that come about? Right. Well, uh, thank you for for having me. Um, this, is, this is a real treat, as I said. And um, Girl Who Made the Stars came from a pitch that I had um, that was based off episode 201, um, Brother. Uh, it's where we start to learn the hints of Michael Burnham's relationship to Spock. And in that episode, which was written by Alex Kurtzman and Jenny Lumet, um, there's a uh, captain's log, or at the time, uh, first officer's log, um, and where Michael Burnham is talking about this origin story um, from the Sam Abathwa people of southwestern Africa. And I was fascinated by that um bit of story and bit of intrigue and it's about this origin story that's based off true mythology where uh, a girl you know dug her hands into the sand threw it into the heavens and that became the stars you know mm -hmm. that was uh, became the girl girl who made the stars and so it was using this in this very poetic and lyrical way um and so i was always pitching about some way to bring that story uh full circle you know and so when i think season two of short treks was announced you know mm -hmm. alex came to me and he said you know, would you would you would you would you be interested in doing a short track something something animated? And I said, um, I I've worked in animation for ten years, so animation is a first love, you know. Uh, but and live action was relatively new to me. I I love live action. I love doing live action. Is there anything live action? He said, ah, I really want to do this animated story. Um, I, I kind of want it to be Afrofuturism. Would you, you think you might be interested? <laughs> I took the hint <laughs> and I said, that sounds amazing. Afrofuturism, like, just stop, say less, you know. Um, and I proceeded to um, kind of write as fast as I could an idea that I hoped um, that Alex and um, you know, the team could say yes to. So that was, that's kind of the origin story for, wow. um, for that short track. And they did say yes. They did say yes. My first draft, they said, <laughs> that might be the hundred million dollar version of our short track. <laughs> could, you write a, could you pare it down a little bit, Brandon? And, um, <laughs> So yeah, so it it started as a maybe, you know, and um, then became then became a yes. So wow. I encourage everybody That's... to watch those along with all the Star Trek uh, short mm -hmm. Trek. Um, they were nominated for an Emmy um, for best short series, and it, it's something that I'm super proud to be associated with. 
um, you know, our, our beloved producing director, Ola Tunde Osunsomni, directed the short, um, did an amazing job, and our Star Trek VFX team like poured every ounce of love into these short treks and creating a workflow on the fly in addition to doing their regular jobs. So there's just a ton of love that were put into these short treks. Um, and it was for, you know, just providing more to the Star Trek community because it definitely wasn't yeah. for the money. It was, it was for, uh, it was for, for the people because, as people might remember, you know, when Discovery came out, we were the first, you know, um, Star Trek um, episodes since Enterprise. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't a lot out there. So Short Treks really filled a um, kind of an important niche, I think, in transitioning us to now what we know uh, of the current um, universe, which is so awesome and so healthy. Brandon, I'm glad you, um, for one, you got a chance to to work on that particular thing that you had the fondness for. And um, now that I'm kind of doing this this class at Stanford on Afrofuturism, it's great that uh, you're, you're bringing the exact topic up. So it's, uh, it's kind of a wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, right. One thing that we hear consistently with Kurtzman and his his reign as the uh, the head Han show for Star Trek is we see a lot of people with upward mobility, people who are um, getting chances to move up in career wise, and it seems to be that is also the case in 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 your case as well. Can you walk us through a little bit about how your talent is being recognized and how there is room for you know elevation for uh, for a writer like yourself? Yeah. Well, I, I started with Discovery um, the day we opened the room um, wow. for um, season one, right? So the the pilot, uh, that was March 7th, uh, 2016. Um, it was... Jesus, that's uh, a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> that's like, oh, Barack 10 years Obama ago. Was president. The world was a very different place. <laughs> very different place. March of yeah. 2016. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, we were trying to get Mer Merrick Garland um, approved for the Supreme Court. That didn't happen. Um, you know, it, it, it was it, as you said, Ryan. It was a, the world was a, a very different place, um, but it was just like the I the project of a lifetime just to be associated with. And as you said, like I started off, I was getting lunch, um, taking orders, taking notes. Um, and writing at the board, you know, anything that anybody needed, like that was my role, along with the other support staff members. And um, yeah, it became um, really an education, even though I had already been, you know, I'd written, produced work. I had produced animation for nine years. I had, I had taught classes, you know, on writing for animation. You know, there were a lot of you know, I had a lot of professional achievements and some people said, why are you going to be an assistant? I said, it's the Star Trek, <laughs> yeah. you know, so anything that I can do to get in the room, you're, you're basically in the nucleus and you know this, Sirach, of like the highest performing people in their fields because this franchise, this story that we've been telling collectively, you know, with blessing of Gene Roddenberry for 60 years, you know, attracts you know high performers of all types you know day three i think we were having a group phone conversation with the writer's room and dr may jemison right mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. <laughs> you know i think week two we were talking to dr paul Stam stamets you know about what would make an astromycologist you know this was like the highest level education that i could that anyone could possibly get in episodic episodic storytelling i mean we had nick myers on staff we had kent um on staff we had uh, joe minoski who is you know um, who I'm lucky to still count as, you know, a close associate and friend, you know, who's written 
who wrote Darmok as well as, well as uh, Old co wrote Jace, you know, these uh, really foundational Star Trek episodes. These were all people um, who uh, started off um, the staff, you know, on that fateful day in March of 2016. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 there's been you know so many amazing writers um who have mentored me and read my work and given me feedback and let me read their work um since then and and it's what's what's great is well one of those people was um my co-writer on this episode um uh Kenneth Lynn mm. uh, we yeah. we've been working together since uh season three and um uh we had our uh first episode that we co-wrote together um uh was um called sanctuary and okay. was uh books um uh first trip home where we learned about the quay john you know so uh so so that this in many ways the episode that we're talking about today is a full circle moment, you know, from mentorship to, you know, collegiality, you know, mm. with, with a fellow writer. You know, speaking of full circle, while you were talking about those first days, mm -hmm. you know, March 2016, episode one, week two, I was thinking for us and for our fans, this is a hello, Brandon Schultz. Nice to meet you, but it's also a goodbye and thank you so much for everything you've done for the last <laughs> seven years. You know, it's it's actually it was actually making me sad realizing that while we're saying hello, we're also thanking all of you and giving you a a goodbye for you know and thanking you for everything that you've given us for the last what is it like sixty five episodes I think it is of Discovery mm -hmm. or thereabouts. And these several years, you gave us hope. Oh, my God, a new Star Trek series. This is it. You created these characters. You did all this. You gave us five seasons. So there's this full circle moment where, yeah, we are saying hello, but we're also saying thank you for the memories. Yeah. Do you, when you're watching these episodes or when you're seeing these episodes come out, because you already lived this a year mm -hmm. or two ago, these goodbyes, sure. but yeah. is it? bringing up those memories of the first days all the way through the last days. Absolutely. I mean, it doesn't take a lot to trigger, you know, those <laughs> memories because you've had these um, really charged moments, you know, and sometimes it might be like pitching really hard for a storyline that means a lot to you, you know, and like in the times where I was an assistant, right. Um, you know, being heard, right? And in the times when I was an assistant, like having, you know, those pitches not go my way, right? <laughs> and then like, okay, how do you how do you channel, you know, energy, creative energy that you feel really strongly about? Well, sometimes you have to write your way out, right? Um, and uh, to 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 paraphrase uh, Hamilton, right? <laughs> so it's like I remember. I remember very clearly season two. Um, I had a strong pitch about, um, which also leads into Girl Who Made the Stars, just about learning more about um, Burnham's uh, Earth parentage, right? Because she, uh, when she came to Sarek and Amanda, she's a ten year old. Now, as a parent of 10-year-old girls, <laughs> I know that that is such a formed human. Who was Michael Burnham before, you know, she came to be Sarah and Amanda's adopted daughter, you know? And so that was a pitch that I had in season two that, you know, was not landing. And so, you know... I did what everyone tells you not to do in that situation, which is to spec your own uh, show and write your own episode um, in your off time. And that was just an example where being part of 
discovery taught me so much, right? It taught me that like when you are running up against barriers, you have to write your way out. You can't com- always convince someone or it can't be an email. <laughs> it has to actually show on the page. And um, that was uh, that was a real learning moment for me because things happened during the season where I was actually able to show this um, idea, you know, my, my script to Alex Kurtzman and, um, he read it, you know, in front of me. (laughs) (laughs) And then he was quiet for about five minutes. And we were about halfway through season, season two. And then he proceeded to pitch me out what the end of season two would be. Mm. Um, incorporating the ideas that I had in my script of Michael Burnham's birth story, but also other ideas that he had been formulating while also running two or three other shows, you know, um, (laughs) uh, to um, kind of explain the, uh, all of the big mysteries that, that we, that our stories were dovetailing towards. Wow. And he said, you're going to write the script or co-write it, you know, and um, it's going to be great. And that was, uh, you know, just a huge moment for me, right? Professionally, um, personally for Alex to have, you know, faith and I did take the time, you know, to read something from at that time. I was an, I was an assistant, you know, um, yeah. It is a it is a through line with um, with um, his era of leadership, you know, um, mm-hmm. with discovery be, and and also for the Michelle Paradise, you know, as our leader, you know, who is now who came to us officially running the shows in season three, but she has always fostered an environment of bringing any idea to the table. You know, as long as it forwards all of the goals, you know what I mean, that we've kind of set out um, on day one and, you know, keep, you know, finding new ways to pitch what is most meaningful to you, you know, Um, and some people say that, you know, and then it's kind of, you know, and those are nice words to hear, but Michelle um and alex they really mean that they really like are fighting for the best ideas Mm. to win wow yeah that's a a testament to uh really kurtzman's leadership and that he's able to really um, invest in the people around him that he you know elevates and gives opportunity all of those things i think are excellent qualities in in a in a real showrunner Um, so I have a question for you. Is this season five, uh, writing for this season five different than the previous seasons in that we have this kind of, uh, treasure hunt, you know, that's a theme throughout the, this, this last season so far Mm -hmm. where you have these clues and missing pieces and one thing takes you to the next place. So it almost makes me think that you have to kind of game plan this stuff uh, together or in advance that, that the episodes don't stand alone for mo- right. uh, so much. Is that different? Yeah. Well, uh, yes and no. I think um, it, uh, I think what we've been able to do is always, um, you know, throughout the tenure on discovery, have a room, you know, that was very cohesive and talked about the season as a whole you know from early days of blue sky and um we kind of broke episodes we call it breaking episodes when we're you know creating our 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 individual episode stories um but we would break episodes as a team and sometimes we would you know kind of subdivide into smaller units um of the writing staff and so that was a continuity so um, that was the same, but I think what was different in this season was just the real confidence in the, in, in every 
tool that we have at our disposal in terms of knowing the uh, you know production team, like having that really good smooth relationship, understanding the limits, where we can push, where we might want to dial back, you know, how we can best utilize our um, cast, you know, and having tested all those things a little bit more, it made the idea of a treasure hunt, you know, type season really uh, buoyant and fun for all of us to break, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Even though it was also pulling your hair out, right? Because you <laughs> you want to keep hiding the ball from the audience and keep doing. And then the, what I love is um, is Michelle's instincts um, in sometimes telling the audience exactly what's going on, you know, and not hiding the ball, you know. And that felt like in certain ways fresh and different, you know, because it wasn't about whether you're going to guess where we're going. It was just how we were getting there. Um, that I think is is fun and interesting. So, so yeah, yeah I, I hope that answers. Uh, you know, in some it does. Way. It does to some degree. You know, um, but you know, this episode has some things that I hadn't seen before. I think the biggest thing that jumped out to me was the visual tra- uh, tricorder or something. Was it the mm. tricorder of the eye? Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. What was up with that? Well, I yeah, had to yeah, do a well, double take. I was like, did they yeah. introduce this? And I just haven't, like, I missed it or I, I, was that new? Yeah. Well, um, oh, oh, it's, it's interesting. We have, there are, I, 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 I don't know if you all noticed, uh, uh, episode three where the, uh, the Itronach episode, um, where, the phasers appear um, uh, from the from the badge. People were yes. saying a similar thing. They didn't know that that could happen, and it's so yes. interesting. That was actually we have uh, 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 the envisioning of our production team up in Toronto since we did the retrofit in season three, right? Um, so the uh, that was always part of it but i don't think we showed it to that the extent right that you saw this season um the the fact that that phasers and everything could emanate from the delta right um and so i think uh um olatunde osinsomni i mean they dream up right Mm. all these visual flair uh so between olatunde and chris byrne who is such a visual director i mean if you go and look through his um imdb and his the episodes of trek and other things that he's directed you just see there's panache in every frame (laughs) so i'm so excited that that everybody's getting something new and i would kind of you know i would let them talk more about it because you know um it's something that has been you know, kind of conceived of for a long time, but I think just just shown for the first time. You know, Brandon, there was something else uh, in this episode that I wanted to touch on. Uh, Culber and Book at the end, mm-hmm. they shared a very Star Trek moment, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. It was kind of like the episode felt like it was ending. And then we got a little moment there. And I was like, this feels very Star Trek. Uh, I still think that the most Star Trek moment was couple seasons ago there was this uh it was i think stamets and jet reno i know it's jet reno and they were talking about a hangnail or maybe it was culber anyway there was so much subtext it was excellent um but in this one this was a very star trek moment and it made me think do you guys deliberately think all right let's get these star trek moments and pepper them in let's get some really good juicy nuggets that people are going to love and pepper them in or does it just kind of happen organically? What what's the process there? Okay, well, this might be a little inside baseball, but love it, love here it. Here we are. He's <laughs> <laughs> fine, baby. Um, so what Michelle does every um, season at the beginning is uh, she has support staff. Um, 
put down all the, the names of the cast members and um, puts them in a hat, you know, and uh, goes around to the staff and each one of the staff picks a name out of the hat. And that becomes, and then you have, that becomes your character, right? You know, to track because we have such a big cast, right? And we want to make sure that each of our cast is being serviced, you know, to to the degree with which we can. And um, that we are not only tracking them from episode to episode, but really season to season, you know, mm-hmm. and how can we give them different things? And um, that day, <laughs> Where um, I uh, picked out uh, Dr. Hugh Culver, you know, and I was so elated, you know, to have, you know, um, Culver as my character. And I've had, I, I, I really, I'm such a sucker because I, I felt that way every time, right? I had this, you know, sensation uh, every time we had this ritual, you know, at the beginning of our seasons. Um, because uh, from our bridge crew to our recurring, you know, to our leads, right? There's just something that is so magnetic about all of our cast members. So, but getting Culver meant a lot because I um, have been, I, I, you know, I feel a kinship um, with his character. I was one of the ones who was saying, you know, it wouldn't it be interesting if Culver was this therapist, you know, had this role, you know, um, which he kind of didn't step into until, you know, we're into seasons two and three. Um, and so ah, I was thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, so, yeah, that I think this. Uh, and it doesn't mean all the writers, of course, are pitching on all the characters. Right. But it would just meant that it was kind of my job to be tracking um, Culver and keep him in mind, keep advocating um, mm-hmm. for how he might factor factor in. So, so yeah, um, uh, so all these episodes were really, really the 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 um, big for me, and um, that moment uh, with book and. Culver meant a lot to me because I lived in New York City. My roommate um, was Puerto Rican, um, and uh, we basically became family. (laughs) And we know um, Culver and, of course, Wilson, right, to share the that to to be a Boricua, you know. And so it was like there was always great pitches from the room on that, not just me. But, um, you know, someone was like, oh, wouldn't it be great if they did um, Aros con Pollo? And I, I said, I feel like <laughs> Culver's recipe would be <laughs> mofongo, you know, uh, like there is something that is really calling to me about that. Right. People, and not everyone knows that dish. Right. But his grandmother, his abuela might. Right. And so we've been teasing this idea of Culver having this you know, uneasiness or this, you know, ex- the spiritual feelings that he can't quite explain, you know. And um, I thought that callback of his family connection um, was a really powerful way to illustrate that story in this episode. So, yeah, it meant a lot to me. And then for Book, right, he sees in Culber, um a way to pay forward, you know, what Culver has given him in mm-hmm. past seasons. He's able to also like be in service. And I thought that was awesome for a book, you know, in, 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 in the season, I really felt more than any other, he really feels like a member of this crew, you know, in like every way possible. And so to end the episode on that note, yeah, um, it was, it was a real thrill. Another introduction, too, I liked in this episode was the abuela. I like the hologram of her, and I think it was accredited to Dr. Pollard's kind of brief alleviation therapeutic 
as uh, some type of program to help deal with mental health. And yeah. I thought our girl Raven. A, yeah, it's a creative way to to deal with mental health as a topic. And I thought that kind of uh, therapeutic may one day find itself become a reality, you know, right. with the existence of AI and all of these other tools that are starting to emerge. So yeah. uh, kudos to you for coming up with that as, as, as well in this episode. I thought it was another highlight for me. Yeah. And I won't even take credit for that. Like I literally, like we form a, like, a, a, a hive mind you know we we become the four <laughs> okay. you know okay so it's like uh you know kenneth has some amazing uh, usually there's one or two things that you can remember okay that's my specific pitch because i had it all stepped out and i i remember what that feeling was and usually it's only because you solved a problem that was like um, you know, a one thirty in the morning problem <laughs> that right. had to be solved by the next day. <laughs> Luckily, this wasn't that, you know, and this was just the room kind of pitching on great ideas. And yeah, I mean, that's that that is what's special about about the staff and uh, this thing is people give like awesome ideas. I know that wasn't my idea, you know what <laughs> I mean? But, but uh, it was it was kind of the, the hive mind, even though, like I say, like, oh yeah, I was pitching on Culver. No, like, you know, there are so many like creative brains, like you would be silly not to listen and champion, you know, kind of some, a storyline like this. So, yeah. Hey, Brandon, we only have you for I, I, another minute here. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Sarak, but real quick, this is something Sarak and I were talking to you about before we hit record. Is that cool mug? And Sarak was like, there's got to be a story behind it. Uh, yeah, Can you please? It. And by the way, that's a cool jacket too, Discovery. Yeah, Season we, we, we want this we guy want to got talk it about all. It. Oh, yeah. I, I you got my questions, right? I came with all my flair. Where's my Where's my hat? <laughs> we we <laughs> want the swag, swag talk. What, yeah. Tell us okay. about this mug and that jacket. As I sip my Earl Grey hot, um, this mug, <laughs> uh, I'm not kidding, actually. Um, uh, this is given to, it says, just book it. And was given to us at the conclude as a wrap gift um, at the conclusion of season three by none other than David Ajala. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, and who, who had hundreds of mugs. <laughs> <laughs> um, in <laughs> Toronto and Los Angeles, and you know, as uh, somebody who you know is in need of you know much coffee and tea drinking <laughs> as the writing <laughs> staff, like we definitely appreciated it. Um, Wilson Cruz, by the way, um, uh, I think it was season two. Yeah, came by with uh, bagels for all of the uh, writing staff. Bagels and cream cheese, uh, nice. which of which Wilson ate approximately zero. <laughs> <laughs> that dude is he ripped. He, he just wants everybody else to get fatter and more <laughs> yeah. out of shape yeah. so he can yeah. look even better. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> Wilson brought the extra uh. shit here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Bagels with the extra shamir for the writers. Uh, so we appreciate <laughs> that, but we we appreciate all the gifts. But I, I love I love David's David. gift though. It's it's got the Nike kind of play off the Nike with the trek instead yeah. of just do it. We got just yeah. book it, which is great. Uh, really, it's great self promotion for David. I think it's it's a, it's a smart idea for him. I, I would tell you, the, the, yeah, such an earnest you know human being. Oh. And um, performer, I just had the benefit of producing um, episodes that featured David heavily, you know, and David's character heavily. Um, and my goodness, like I love his character, and I like his character's wardrobe. I think he's got probably <laughs> the best wardrobe out yeah. of all the Star Trek cast. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you about that sweatshirt too? Is that some swag from season? Oh yeah, from one of the seasons. This is our season three um, crew uh, sweater, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, that is dope awesome. too. Definitely a cool, a cool per perk. I think uh, another season we got a uh, Michelle is is so kind and so hilarious. Secretly, um, 
she got us a, a full body snuggie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, a so triple we, snuggie. <laughs> yeah, triple. Snuggie. It was kind of great for the crew in Toronto, you know, for those of us in like uh, balmy Los Angeles. <laughs> we haven't had a chance to break up the snuggie very much. Wow. <laughs> well, not to be outdone here at the seventh rule. At the end of our season, we have some May 15th, 80% off Easter candy that's going out to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like the leftovers uh, in the corner of the CVS that's like 80%. Oh, yeah. Anyway. No, but, well, but, you know, our whole team is good to us. Uh, John Van Sitters, you know, who mm-hmm. is the head of the Star Trek franchise group. I remember yeah. like season two. We had nothing in the office. He gave us all this art to decorate the office. It really was like the kind of the Willy Wonka playground, you know, vibe that um, <laughs> you would want it to be, um, or that you might imagine it to be, especially in those those early, you know, heady days. Mm. But still. Well, Brandon, this yeah. has been way too much fun. And we just want to say how much we appreciate you taking the time today, but also the last eight years, my goodness, it's been a (laughs) long, hard road. It's been so worth it. Thank you for everything that you've done as a crew, uh, starting in as a writer's assistant saying, doggone it, I'll be an assistant. I'll write on the whiteboard. It's Star Trek. I'm going to do it. (laughs) And then yeah. you clearly showed off your skill. You, you moved it. up. You got a short Trek episode, multiple uh, Discovery episodes, so many bigger and better things on the way in your future. But for now, we just want to say thank you very much for everything yeah. you've done. That's amazing. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Thank you, Sirac. Um, Means a ton coming for you. And thank you for doing this. This is this is this is my my dream. You know, um, when I was. Not not that I'm featured on the episode, right? But that we're talking about discovery, like, you know, in, in such a way and the, the people and the fan base have kind of lifted us up, you know, at at every turn. Um it it is a, a true honor because I'm I'm just here representing like all the crafts people, our amazing prop master, our amazing VFX team, our incredible post team, you know, it's nice to be the writer and be called up, but those are the people, those, they're all storytellers, right? Mm -hmm. And -hmm. without them, you don't get the episode of Whistle Speak that, you know, kind of you guys are, you know, excited about, like it, they build us up so many times because they're pitching us ideas. They're saying, what if this did this, you know, and what if we were able to show this holographic, you know, image of a tricorder, you know, it's like, that is the magic um, of discovery is that we have these dedicated people, our location guys in Toronto speak Klingon, like, (laughs) wow, these are the type of people who are, who are making the show. um, By the way, uh, good locations for choices for this episode as well, because I did feel like I was taking, uh, taken away into like some enchanted you know, forest somewhere. So um, that also worked well in this episode, mm-hmm. speaking of locations. Not going to find that in LA, I'll um, tell you that much. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, can't say enough about them. Our, our, also our like the use of the Tibetan uh, bowls. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, I actually was looking at my own bowl while I was watching that bowl oh, on TV. Nice. So I was thinking, hey, I got one of those. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay, awesome. No, okay, no, that, that, that is a pitch I will take credit for, you know, or you know, a story a story device I will take credit for because I remember that one. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like Pretty it. Awesome. I want to say we're we're exploring this Bronze Age civilization, right? And how right. do you also, you know, how do you show that they're less advanced but also really recognizing that the tradition of prime directive episodes from TNG and who watches the watchers, you know, um, to TOS, like that is something. And also how do we respect a civilization and show respect for a civilization that we don't categorize as, as advanced as us, you know, when we know in our own human history that we may have, uh, lost more knowledge than we've remembered, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the Romans 
uh, had a technique for curing cement that is, and concrete that we still don't have mastered today, right? It was better then. You know, you have the Vedic medicine that has been lost to history, you know, but is like renowned for how amazing and advanced and how non-invasive it was. You know, you have African and indigenous shamanic traditions that use sound therapy, right? Mm -hmm. yep. So that being a personal uh, fascination of mine, uh, that was some uh, an area that I was advocating for. And it just happened to work out into, you know, um, hopefully kind of, solving a story problem so that's sound therapy that's definitely out there uh <laughs> as in out here in, in this world not not out there you know but that's definitely <laughs> something that yeah. is in existence and it's really cool to see that yeah. it's really cool to yeah. see that being brought into the storytelling um and we are going to cover this episode a lot more right after our break but brandon awesome. once again this has been so cool we really appreciate you Thank you very much for everything that you've done and for taking the time and being super gracious with your time with us today. Um, yeah. Everybody at home, stick around. We've got a lot more to talk about on The Seventh Rule. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. That was Brandon Schultz. That guy is freaking amazing. So lucky to have him. Uh, now I just wish we had him more often because that guy was great. So cool that we're getting some of the writers this season. Here are the trivioids of the week. Stamets theorizes that scientists create clues that we can't figure out to mock us. Michael Burnham wants to try history and anthropology. Kovich found a genuine 21st century legal pad. Although, by the way, they were crossing them off. I'm like, what are you doing? That's like a total heirloom. Like it's 800, <laughs> a thousand years old and they're just crossing it off. Uh, Abuela calls Colbert Nene. Denobulan weather towers seed clouds with silver iodine. Hugh asks Paul to be his assistant. Rava has been telling Tilly of the high summit. And Dr. Colbert interrupts books, video game playing. All right. So we talked a little bit during the break uh, with Brandon about the sylvadors, people that sing or that they whistle when they talk, when they speak, right? Or uh, whistling yeah. is a fashion of speech. In the Canary Islands, it's called sylvadors. It's a bunch of different places. That just means people that whistle. And I was saying how I did a little uh, a film called The Assassin's Apprentice. Sorry, The Assassin's Apprentice, Sylvadors of the Canary Islands. This was a couple of years ago. I just wanted to point this out. A lot of fun oh, wow. here. Uh, check out some of the stars. Armin Shimmerman. Uh, wow. The late, great, rest in peace, Gary Graham. We got our good buddy, Tracy Coco, of course. Sean Kenny, who played Captain Pike in the original Star Trek series. This, the yeah. ageless wonder, this guy. Tara Page. Um, Melissa Longo, that you may know, and a bunch of others. Our good buddy Bill. Yeah. Look at who's there. Bill Victor Arukin. Uh, that's the one. So, anyway, good stuff. Ryan T is in there and a bunch of other cool people. Anyway, so Q40A, the late great. And so you were you were whistling in this thing, or what was going on with that? No, um, what it was was um a lot of it takes place in the Canary Islands. And okay. we had these droids, you know, or these drones that fly around and the way they communicate, because they were, they were uh, not trained, they were programmed by Silbadors in the Canary Islands. So they communicate with whistles, kind of like R2-D2, you know, R2-D2 goes, you know, whatever these guys right, communicate. Right, right. But we actually had real Silbadors doing actual whistle speak. So when we would say we want the the drone to say this, they would actually get in a recording booth and whistle it out. So we learned a lot about whistle speak. And that's why I was kind of interested to watch this episode. There's a lot to learn. You have to research these kind of things, you know, if you want to make it seem legit. And our executive producer and writer, Mr. Paul Hickman, went deep into it and even filmed on location and did all this kind of stuff so 
he definitely didn't half-ass it. <laughs> he, he, he learned every single bit. And we had these really cool uh, Silvador consultants that would record and they would tell us, you know, and uh, consult with us. And it was really co cool, really a lot of fun. Anyway, I didn't want to talk about that too long, but this is a real thing. People do have whistle speak in a lot of places around the world. This one just happened to be in the Canary Islands. And today's episode happened to be on this planet that had the really cool background. Sirak, you were talking about, again, the production design, blowing us away, the locations department. Yeah. It was so cool, wasn't it? It was. And it actually made me think, oh, wow, well, they stepped their game up from the uh, everybody's in a little town playing hacky sack around the little fountain in the village. Yeah. They, <laughs> they, they must have been listening to us on that because they did switch that up and make it, they made it a lot better um, and believable, you know? So I like that part of it too as well. Wait a minute. You're that trying to say that that little courtyard where kids are playing hacky sack and somebody's carrying... A basket of fruit is not believable. <laughs> it's just like not on every single. And then planet. two they people, switch it up. somebody <laughs> showing another person some fabric. Oh, you know, yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> in every TNG episode. <laughs> yeah, we've seen it. They 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 definitely didn't give us a recycle on that. Mm -hmm. uh, they built out the culture. Um, you can tell that. Um, you know, the writers put in a lot of work into building out the culture. Obviously, we saw the the kind of tattoo head head design, whatever was on their forehead to just kind of, you know, give them a little bit of accentuation. I thought that was a good touch. Um, the clothes seem similar to the wardrobe that we usually see when we see these kinds of, you know, random bronze any, age. anywhere, yeah. the bronze age type of um, people. But, yeah, I like the idea of the Tibetan healing bowls culturally. Um, I like the idea of their belief system. We got into a little bit of their belief system as far mm -hmm. as, you know, what the tower was, the function of this this tower and what it would meant to them, the sacrificing of uh, for that cause. So, I mean, th those were some pretty good um, elements that I thought made it interesting. Yeah. The world uh, building. There were, yeah, definitely this race was very fleshed out. Their mythology, you know, the way they talk with each other, uh, all that kind of stuff was really cool. Um, one yeah. thing I wondered about uh, was the Prime Directive. We kind of mentioned it at the end of the first segment. I had so many more questions to ask Brandon. You know, what a, what a great guy. He fielded so many of our questions. But another one I was thinking about was the Prime Directive. I wonder if there was a conversation in the writer's room saying, is the prime directive still in effect 800 years from now? Or are they like, bro, it's the prime directive. It's the one that has to stay forever. It's it's the one. You know, I remember, I, I wonder if there was any kind of conversation there, if it was just like, you know, it's obviously going to be there. Denobulans, um, that was the the race that did the trade route. That was... Dr. Phlox in Star Trek Enterprise was a Denobulan, and that is the one played by John Billingsley. He is the big Denobulan. Uh, so that was really cool to hear about them. I did know be that. Did know that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So Sorry that's what it's like that. to be on the receiving end of a yes, bad joke. Now I finally feel like. your pain. <laughs> You see it? That's what it feels like. Thank you for demonstrating. <laughs> but no, um, <laughs> the um, the thing that I did like, though, I, going back to the abuela, I like that part, just the whole ways to deal with mental health that they're trying to kind of implement in this episode. That kind of jumped out to me a lot. Um, you know, also... I really love Tilly's performances. I feel like she's so natural and just like, yeah. it's, it's, it's almost like she's it's not acting for her. She's just, yeah. Being, right. She's just, yes. It's as if those words are coming yeah. out of her mouth, not off of a page. And uh, I also thought it was really cool. Speaking of her, that she and Michael Burnham were, were running again, like the old days, like 
the first season, they'd be running around the ship and, you know, she's training her and it's like, oh, it's like the good old days. I'm sure that was not an accident. That was fun to see. Yeah, a little bit of running, a little bit. I was thirsty watching this episode. It just, <laughs> <laughs> I had dry mouth. Make sure you have uh, some water when you're sitting down watching this episode. A bowl of but water. Yeah, a, b- a bowl of water. <laughs> uh, there were some things that you, you mentioned the Prime Directive. It's funny because as many times as they talk about the prime directive, it seems like I've seen the prime directive broken almost every single time that they bring it up. Uh, yes. Almost every time they talk about it's the prime directive, you know, we have to, we can't interfere for some reason. They always interfere. Uh, I just recently watched a rewatch on the past tense, uh, Gabriel bell and the bell riots episode. And I, I, <laughs> You know, Cisco comes in there. He basically is Gabriel Bell. I mean, completely, <laughs> yes. completely like, you know, destroying, I guess, whatever this prime directive thing. Because, I mean, if there's a butterfly effect of whatever mm-hmm. actions that you take, then you would think that there is going to be a huge butterfly effect for Burnham exposing herself to this guy, you know, uh, in this episode who has this kind of prehistoric perception of the world and then he's being you know shown his planet from an aerial view on Florida spacecraft so it's like all of these things are like what are the repercussions you know um going down the line how how much effect do these small moments of breaking the prime directive actually add up to you know that's one question i'm always left with but it is an interesting point that like I, I can't remember an episode of Star Trek where they mention the Prime Directive and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, right. Anyway, <laughs> all right, set a course for the, the next star <laughs> cluster. They're always like, yeah, yeah but uh, maybe. But what about this? What? Ah, you it's know, just it's, one person. They won't. It's just the one guy. <laughs> but they've never mentioned the Prime Directive and then followed it. Sometimes they try. Sometimes they try for the first like 30 or 40 minutes. And then they're like, well, we tried, but this guy was going to die. What do you want me to do? I got to use my phaser, bro. I got to use it. (laughs) Yeah. And that was the case uh, in this episode where they followed the prime directive. But then at the very end, they're like, well, look, we got to save some lives. We got to save Tilly. That other girl, eh, whatever. You know, we just met her. But Tilly... (laughs) We got to save Tilly because she is going to be a teacher at Starfleet Academy, which, by the way, they mentioned. So I thought it was really cool that they keep bringing it up. They keep teasing it because you know that that is the next spinoff here. So it's always very interesting when they bring that up a bit. Yeah, it is interesting. Um, Yeah, my nitpick. Well, this episode is very small, but it's like it's one of my nitpicks. Uh, Tilly is is stuck in this room where the oxygen is being sucked out because it's going to turn into a vacuum. Okay, okay. Before you say it, can I guess what it is? Because it might be the same as me. How is the fire still going? How is the fire? (laughs) Yes, same team, man. Same team. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or put out the fire or something because this is killing our oxygen right here. This yeah. is not what we need. <laughs> yeah, blow that thing out. But then I start thinking, hey, it's a different planet. Maybe fire. I don't know. But that's funny. Yeah, blow the fire out. It's sucking up all your oxygen. Here's the culprit. <laughs> yes. It's going to take it half of the time up. Uh, so, yes, that was one of the things. I'm like, put the fire out, guys. What are you doing? Uh, it's my, my little nerd inside of me just jumps up and starts being really particular. Well, technically if it's a vacuum. (laughs) Right now there's somebody walking next to you in the hotel being like, that guy's a nerd. (laughs) (laughs) But, but yeah, no, this episode, you know, like I was telling him, it's, it's, it feels like there's like like I said, this is this treasure hunt and this, you know, all the pieces have to fit in together. And, um, you know, it just makes me wonder 
you know, when you're when you're scripting out what you know to be the last season, if that changes, you know, the way you approach the storytelling. If you know we're wrapping it all up in a bow, this is all we've got here. We got ten episodes in front of us. Um, I'm pretty sure it changes the approach that you take. Well, yeah, but if you'll recall, they did not know this was going to be the last season when they wrote this one. For I mean, for all we know, they may have had a hunch. They may have known that it's certainly likely or possible or whatever. I don't know. But that's why they went back and re-recorded or re-shot some additional footage afterwards. And it just makes me think like there's only four episodes of Discovery left ever. <laughs> That's right. nuts. Right. I mean, you almost yeah. feel like we've been taking it for granted if when you've had it in your life for seven years, you know, they started, you know, the writer's room in 2016, it premiered in 2017, yeah. but that's it. Four weeks from now, we will be closing the book on book. Uh, on book. And Burnham yeah. and, and Tilly and all of them. And I think we're going to look back and be like, wow. They did a lot in 65 episodes, I think it is. Yes, uh, they did a lot. Yeah. And, and it's coming to a close right now. So it's it's a little... Uh, <clears throat> it's sad that it's it's ending. There's a sadness that sits into it. But, but um, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to see... I, I'm, I'm curious to know what changes they did make when they did find out that it was the last season, right. what kind of additional changes. So we first have to watch it, and then we have to go through it. I, I, I believe it's all added in the last episode, if I remember correctly. Because I wondered, I thought that maybe they would go and drop little pieces, some in episode two, some in episode seven, you know, kind of like spackle yeah. it in. But I believe what, what what was confirmed was that it was added on to the end of episode 10. So maybe it's okay. going to be like, like what we had at the end of Deep Space Nine. Remember, Chief O'Brien holds that army soldier up, and then he goes through that whole memory of all that stuff. And then Dax goes, and then there's not a dry eye in the house. It's like, oh my God, I can't even talk about it without getting emotional. But maybe they're going to go back and do something like that. But whatever it is, they're going to, they were able to go back and shoot and close up, you know, tie up these loose ends. So I think yeah. we may have to wait till episode 10 for that. Okay. I'm willing. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. But anyway, um, that's about all the time we have for this week. Unbelievable okay. to say there are only four episodes left. Great episode. Crazy. Great guest. Thank you very much to Brandon Schultz. And thank you very much to... Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Titus Moeller, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, my live from Tokyo, the Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, the Dark Lord, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Henry Unger, Allison Leach, High, Julie Manisfi, Greg K. Wickstrom, Jed Thompson, Dr. Susan V. Gruner, Glenn Iverson, Dave Gregory, Tim Baum, Chris Sternett, Christopher D. Marshall, Joanna Yonker, Roy Epen, and of course, Jason M. Oaken. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you very much for hanging out with us. It's been a great time. Please make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon for notifications. If you're listening in, give us a five-star rating and a nice review. We'd really appreciate that. Yeah. All right, Sirach, four episodes left. Yeah. Sweet. Hit it. Oh, wait, let's fly, I mean. <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much for myself, Sirach Loft, and Melissa Longo. Mr. Aaron Eisenberg, thank you for hanging out with us. And until next time, always remember the seventh rule.